I'm Adam Wickline. I'm the manager of the Potomac River Boat Program with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Every day we're taking out students on Potomac and Anacostia Rivers and showing them uh, ways to measure the health of the river as well as um, just showing them that life still exists in an urban environment such as Washington, D.C. <laughs> That's your prediction. The Potomac River Boat Program is one of the many floating classrooms under the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Each year, more than 30,000 students and teachers obtain a valuable environmental experience. It's important because most students in the urban and suburban environments are disconnected from these waterways. Public access is a big problem, so not many people get to actually experience the river uh, like they will on this boat, the Susquehanna. The important part for them is just to see that water quality is not perfect, but it's not completely devoid of life. It's important for them to catch fish that are in the river and, like I said before, see that there is still something worth saving in the Potomac River. I learned today that um, a fish on the end of its dorsal fins has um, spikes and when, um, they, when it comes up more, it um, makes it look larger and that there are a lot of species in the um, Potomac River. I learned today that there, there were um, there, that fish's um, scale gills are kind of red because it kind of it brings the blood it brings all the oxygen to the blood system so it's able to live and breathe. And ultimately, the importance of this trip is to drive home the connection of land and water. What these students are doing on land is having a direct impact on the Potomac as well as the Chesapeake Bay. On a typical day, students learn about the health of the bay and the surrounding watershed. In John Smith's time, the bay contained large populations of oysters and blue crabs, as well as over 350 different species of fish. As the colonists spread over the 64,000 square mile watershed that includes New York, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia, the bay began to feel the effects of human life. By 1984, the acres of the bay covered with underwater grasses had dropped from 200,000 to 37,000. The blue crab population declined to 60 million. The Anacostia River in the District of Columbia became of particular concern in the 80s as conditions worsened all over the watershed. Today, over 16 million people live in the watershed, receiving their water from the area's 100,000 miles of streams and rivers. While the average rating of health of the bay has remained low, many great improvements have been made. In 2009, the spawning blue crab population reached 223 million, the highest since 1993. Additionally, underwater grasses flourished in 9,034 more acres of the shallows. In fact, most health scores on various testing sites were recorded as fair, good, or excellent between 2000 and 2008. While total decrease in sediment and nutrient pollution bodes well, these two remain significant problems in the bay. Nutrient pollution from excess nitrogen and phosphorus causes algae blooms. The algae blocks sunlight to submerge aquatic vegetation, which die off. Once the algae dies as well, there are no longer any oxygen-producing plants, creating what is called a dead zone. No life can survive there. Dead zones are a huge problem in the bay. Since its founding, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation has worked tirelessly to save the bay. Through their education programs, kids are brought up close and personal with their local waterways and learn why the bay needs to be saved. I think we came to this trip because all the pollution and ways to learn about it prevented from going to the Chesapeake Bay and all the rivers. What will you do about it?